Good morning. And welcome to worship today. It is good to be together, to come and worship our God, to join together in praise and in the Holy Spirit. Welcome to those who are visiting with us today. We're glad that you're here. We pray that you'd be blessed in our time together. Just a couple of announcements as we get started this morning. Uh, first of all, as you see in the bulletin, it is the final day uh, for the flower sign up for the, the Dorcas Society sponsored uh, Easter flowers. And, and so be sure if you still need one of those to sign up after the service. And then next week, uh, just a, a reminder that there will be a fellowship potluck following the Sunday school hour. And so all are invited to that. Uh, and next Sunday afternoon, we are also set to lead the worship services over at the, the uh, nursing homes. Uh, and so feel welcome to join for those. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 42. The psalmist writes, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. While men say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Let's come before God in prayer this morning. <clears throat> oh Lord our God, for some of us here this morning, we identify well with those words that there is this sense in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives that we are downcast, that we are, are missing you, that we are struggling, oh God, and we're wondering where is your goodness, where is your providence in our life. And yet, Lord God, there are others of us as well who don't feel that at all, that we don't feel this, this great gulf between us and you, that we feel you are right here with us, Lord. We celebrate the many things that you are doing in our own lives. And Lord God, whatever our life situation is, our circumstances, we pray that, that you would draw our hearts and minds to, to the truth of what the psalmist speaks, that you are there that you are still Lord and God, and that you are the Savior of all who call on you. Mm. And so, Lord God, fill us with your Holy Spirit, who you have promised to give us. And may our worship and our praise be accepting to you, for Jesus' sake. Amen. As we come before the Lord our God, let's stand to sing, Days of Elijah. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, Still we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. And these are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David, rebuilding the temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are white in your world. And we are your laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. God like
like Jehovah. There's no God 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 like Jehovah. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call so lift your voice it's the year of jubilee and out of zion's hill salvation comes so lift your voice it's the year of jubilee and out of zion's hill salvation comes Salvation comes from our God, the same God who is here with us, the same God who gives us his blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship and humble ourselves before God with give us clean hands. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. O oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. O oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. And God, let us be a generation that seeks that seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. O oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, O oh, Spirit, come make us humble. You may be seated. For our call to confession today, we turn to Psalm 145. And, and this psalm, in, in some respects, is... is uh, a strange psalm for this. Uh, it's a psalm that, that as we listen to it, it's a song that, that praises God, that, that just speaks who He is over and over again. And yet it's because of who God is, it's because of the promises that He echoes in His Word to His people, that we trust these things, we believe them to be true. And they are the things, they are the truths, His promises that draw us to repent before Him, knowing that He is a gracious God. And so I invite you to listen. These words come from Psalm 145, verses 8 through 10, and then jumping ahead into verse 13 and following. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All you have made will praise you, O Lord. Your saints will extol you. The Lord is faithful to all his promises. He's loving toward all he has made. The Lord upholds all those who fall, and he lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their fruit at the proper time. You open your hand, and you satisfy the desires of every living thing. 
The Lord is righteous in all His ways. He's loving toward all He has made. The Lord is near to all who call on Him. To all who call on Him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear Him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love Him, but all the wicked He will destroy. And so, brothers and sisters, we enter into a time of of confession, a prayer of confession, and, and, and I'll open that Uh, And then I invite you to spend some time in silent prayer as well before I close. Let's pray. Oh Lord our God, as we come into your presence this day, we come humbled by you. We come humbled by the truth of who you are that is spoken in this psalm. We come humbled by you in the words that, that we sang just a few moments ago. That you are a God who is great. You are a God who is sovereign and who is powerful. And yet you are also a God who is compassionate and gracious, who is slow to anger and abounding in love. You are a God that cares for and loves all who call on you in truth. And so, Lord God, as we take time this morning to confess our sins, to lay down the things that that have become obstacles, that have become stumbling blocks before us. Oh Lord, would you hear us and forgive us? Oh Lord, our God, we are thankful for the promise of Your mercy. We are thankful not just for glimpses and shadows and the hope of faith unseen, but Lord, we are thankful that we can testify to the saving work of Jesus Christ. To Your Son, who You sent in the form of one of us to die on the cross, not for Himself, not for anything he had done wrong, for he was completely perfect and innocent and sinless, but for us and for our guilt and for our punishment. He he took that upon himself. And Lord God, we then come and we praise you because of who you are and for what you have done for us. Lord God, continue to cleanse us and purify us from all unrighteousness. Continue to fill us with your Spirit in such a way that our lives and our hearts and our minds are drawn more and more to you so that our nature may be renewed even as a child of you. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so hear these words of assurance that are spoken by the Apostle Peter. He He says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. In keeping with His promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Let's sing our song of response. Out of my bondage, sorrow and night, Jesus, I come. Sickness into thy health, 
out of my want and into thy wealth, out of my sin and into thyself, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my shameful failure and loss, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into the glorious gain of thy cross. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of earth's sorrows into thy balm, out of life's storms and into thy calm, out of distress to jubilant psalm, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of unrest and arrogant pride, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come, into thy blessed will to abide. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of myself to dwell in thy love, out of despair into raptures above. Upward for I on wings like a dove, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of the fear and dread of the tomb, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into the joy and light of thy home. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of the depths of ruin untold, into the peace of thy sheltering fold, ever thy glorious face to behold. Jesus, I come to thee. Let's go to our God in prayer this morning. Our good and gracious Father, as we come into your presence, we come accepting the invitation of your grace. And Lord God, we enter then into the, the throne room. We enter before you where you welcome us in. You present before all who call on you and who trust in you, who have, have put their full hope in you, that, that there is a door that cannot be shut for us. And Lord God, how grateful we are for that. That as slow as we may be sometimes, as, as negligent as we might be at other times, that you are present and that you are with us. That you are the one who not only gives us the hope of of eternal life, but you are the one who gives us the hope and the promise that you do listen when we call upon you. And so, Lord God, we do that this morning. We come before you with our needs. We come before you with our joys. We come before you with our struggles and our troubles and with our requests. That, Lord God, as we come before you, we know that there are many in this church and in this area who continue to, to battle against different illnesses and, and colds and flus. And, and Lord God, we pray that for some, uh, those things are, are more severe than others, but for many of us, it's, it's simply a, a, an annoying thing. Lord God, we pray that you would heal us and that you would bring strength and new life into our bodies. Lord God, we think those who, of those who have much more chronic illnesses, of those who are, are battling against cancer, those who are battling against pain due to, to nerve issues or structural issues in their back and, and that limit their ability to, to move comfortably and to sit long or, or, or to walk around and go about things that, that many of us take for granted. 
Lord God, we pray that you would restore them and that you would give them a measure of your healing in the week ahead. Lord, we think of others who are, are grieving at this time, of those who are, are struggling with depression, of those who are, are worried and, and filled with anxiety about things that, that may be in their control, but, but for many it, it's things that, that we have made too much of, that are out of our control. Lord God, we pray that, that we, as your people, would be willing and able to cast our cares upon you, that we would cast our burdens, and that we would take up the, the light and the easy yoke that you promise us. Lord, amidst the struggles of our day, we also lift up to you the, the many good things that are happening. Lord God, we thank you for health, if, if we have good health right now. We thank you for shelter and warmth from inclement weather and and, and from the, the severe cold and, and winds that we experienced in this week. We thank you, O oh God, for the, the health and strength that you've given to, to Christy this far in her pregnancy. And Lord God, in, in the weeks ahead as she prepares to deliver a baby, we pray that you continue to be near unto her. Grant health and strength to her body and to the baby. Lord God, we lift up to you with, with thanksgiving the, the work of our schools and in uh, the opportunities that our students have, whether that's at, at the Baldwin Woodville, Baldwin Woodville School District or, or at BCS or at home schools, Lord God, we pray that these places of education, Lord God, with the, with the many hours and, and the commitment that their teachers and faculty give, Lord God, that you would continue to build up our, our young children and our teenagers as well, Lord God, that you would be preparing them and equipping them, not just in a a spiritual way and that you would sustain them spiritually in those places. But Lord God, that you are shaping their minds, that you are putting into them the things of your creation, the things that are, are, are from you. Lord God, as they learn about how people have related and how people have worked and, and how science laws work and how math laws work and how we're still figuring things out here in our universe, Lord God, would you equip our children to learn and to grow that they might contribute to society not only in the, the future but now as well. Lord God, we think of other places where we see your goodness, that we continue to see your faithfulness and your providence in the work of, of many ministries, both here at, at Baldwin Christian Reformed Church as we think about the, the Bible studies and the fellowship groups that we are able to be a part of and, and that we invite others to be a part of Lord God we pray that you would bless them we think especially of uh, of the outreach of the gems program and ask that that you would allow that to, to continue and to thrive and, and Lord would you give strength and, and support to those who lead in that and in cadets and and to our other teachers and volunteers but Lord God we think of the ways that that other organizations who we are connected to continue to serve abroad of of world renew of resonate of other mission organizations, of, of Operation Christmas Child. Lord God, it's so easy to think of these things simply on a, an offering Sunday or, or a Sunday when we're involved in them or hearing directly about them. And yet, Lord God, as each of these organizations do work year-round and, and are sending people around the globe to spread your good news, to share your love, Lord God, we pray that, that you would bless them and also that you would allow there to be a receptiveness in the hearts of those who they go to. Oh, Lord, our God, we pray uh, along the lines of, of school for, for safe travels for those who continue to, to travel back to this area from spring break away. And, and Lord God, that, that you would be with students and faculty as they enter into these last couple months of school. Lord God, strengthen them and give them uh, alertness and a willingness to, to, to stay committed. Lord God, for our students who are graduating high school this year, we pray, especially for them, Lord God, that you would be with them, that, that you would... Grant them clarity and, and understanding for these last months, but also, Lord God, for whatever is ahead of them as they make choices and, and live into the choices that they have made for the, the immediate future. Lord God, be with them and, and strengthen them. Lord, we pray that as we enter into your word today that you would bless us, that you would open our hearts, open our minds, that we might be willing to listen that we might be willing to hear the words that you have set before your church for 2,000 years almost. 
for words that might shake us out of apathy, for words that might cause us to to stir from being lazier or from being less committed than, than we ought to be, for not being ex- as excited and as passionate about your grace as what you would have us be. Lord, allow us to listen, and, and because we have listened, that we would in turn obey with thanksgiving. Lord, fill each one here, and each who hears this message. All this you pray in your son's name. Amen. Well, boys and girls, I'm going to invite you forward now for our children's message. like my daughter is excited or something, guys. She's saying, come on. Oh, you're going to sit with them today? Okay. How are you guys? Good? You're all awake this morning more than last time? Kind of. All right. I think Brooks is more awake. Faye is more awake. Uh, Guys, it is the last week in the sermon series that we've been in. We've been looking at Revelation 2 and 3, and we are on the seventh letter, the seventh church in Asia Minor. Uh, And and so you get to stop hearing me talk about that. Uh, But I'm going to talk about the ancient city of Laodicea in a little bit with the whole congregation, not just with you guys. Uh, But but there's a picture that I want to show you. Owen, can you flip ahead to the pre-sermon first slide there? Uh, I know it's, it's probably a little bit hard for you to see, but, but what is in that picture? Jesus? It is. It's supposed to be Jesus. Jesus has a crown on his head. What else do you see there? What? A lantern? Why is there a lantern, do you think, Addy? So you can see? Can you see what the title of that painting is? Oh, man, you can't see past the pulpit. Can you read it? What's the title of that painting? Light of the world. Is Jesus the light of the world according to the Bible? He is indeed, right? So that's why he's got a lantern. That's why it's called that. There's one more piece, and I know it's really hard to see, and I don't know that this is going to help you out anymore. But what does that look like? What do you say, Brooks? It kind of looks like a tree. It's a door. Very good. It's a door. And the reason why it's a door and why that makes sense is because this painting is inspired by the passage that we're going to read. It's inspired by the very same thing that, that I crafted our, our sermon title from. Uh, what do you notice about that door? What do you see up there? He's knocking on the door. Uh, is it missing something that most doors have? It's missing a door handle. Bingo. What else do you see? Kind of towards the bottom. I see something that looks kind of like a Kind of like what? A, a rake? It kind of looks like that, but it's actually brush. So it's kind of vines and just sticks and weeds growing up. Uh, and, and that is important. That's really important. If I were to go to you guys' houses, uh, is that what your doors are like? Is there all kind of brush? Why not? Why is there no brush in front of your doors? It'd be hard to open, right? It'd be hard to go in and out. And, and if you go into someone's yard, maybe you guys go into your backyards and, and, and there's a place that is kind of overgrown. There's just weeds and sticks and vines. And it's because you don't go back there much, right? You don't walk through that area. It doesn't have to be cleared out. Well, the artist who made this picture, this is the verse that he was looking at. We're going to read in Revelation 3.20, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And so Jesus was saying to these people who were part of a church back then, part of a group of believers who who thought, you know what, we're doing pretty well. We look like really good Christians. And Jesus comes and says, your door is closed. And I'm not even inside with you. I'm on the outside. You have left me alone. That's not a good idea, is it? That's not a wise idea for Christians to leave Jesus out. It's not wise or smart for us to convince ourselves, hey, we're doing really well, and yet to know nothing about Jesus and to not be listening to him, to not be doing what he says. And so maybe it's hard for you guys, and it's even hard for adults, to imagine or or to really understand how can these people, how can these people believe in Jesus or say they do, but not have him in their church, right? That doesn't necessarily make much sense. Hopefully we'll 
will begin to understand that. But God promises that that one day will come, right? A day in heaven when we will be with him. When we'll get to eat with him, when we'll be face to face with him. For now, we're not there yet. Yep, he came in. It's okay. But for now, we're not there yet. And yet, the Bible talks about a number of times that for Christians, there's an open door. And in the New Testament, it, it's saying how there's an open door to go out and do ministry, to teach people, to disciple people about Jesus who have never heard about him before. And so we are to go out. But Jesus is also looking that the door to our hearts, right, the door for us to believe, would be left open for him to come in. And so that's my hope for you guys, that you would take that seriously, that Jesus wants into your life, he wants into your heart, he wants into your mind, and we have to let him in. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the way that you pursue us, for the way that you are willing to go and to change our lives, and also the ways that you are willing to wait for us. Lord God, I pray for these boys and girls, that you would be with them, that you would strengthen them and, and show yourself to them each day. And Lord God, that you would c continue to work in their hearts by your Holy Spirit, that they would be open to receiving you. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. Say amen. Amen. All right. What? You think there's candy up there, huh? No, you get one piece of candy. Whoa. You guys are snapping off the basket over here. Thanks. All right. You can go back? Thanks, guys. All right. I invite the rest of you to open your Bibles with me then to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3, verses 14 through 22. And I know that that picture is kind of washed out. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a very vibrantly colored picture. Uh, and, and so if you want to see it up closer, you can look online uh, a little bit later when it's posted up there. Uh, but as I said to the boys and girls, this is the final sermon in our series. And some of you, I know at least one, are really excited about that. You're ready for me to get out of Revelation. And others of you are saying, well, where's letter 8 and 9 and 10? And can we just keep hearing these? And, and I don't have them for you. Uh, this is the last one, right? Jesus has said something to these churches over and over again. You've heard it the last six straight weeks that Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus is speaking these churches back then and us today. We must be listening. We must be receiving his word. We must be trusting him. We must be examining ourselves and then responding in humble and grateful obedience. And so there's one last letter that we get to hear that from. And it's the letter to the church in Laodicea. Before we read this letter, who are the recipients? Well, one more time you get to see this map. The red star kind of over here. We're working farther and farther to the east. The red star is where Laodicea was. Uh, and Laodicea is a city that is mentioned elsewhere in Scripture. Uh, if you're in the book of Colossians, you find that Paul... Uh, Paul writes about them. Paul includes them in that letter. And that makes sense because Laodicea was 10 miles to the northwest of Colossae. And so we find in Colossians 4 that there was enough of a partnership or familiarity in Paul's day that Paul says, hey, I'm writing both of you letters. And obviously we don't have the Laodicean letter in Scripture. That's been lost. Uh, but we do know that he told the Colossians after you're done reading your letter, swap letters and read each other's letters. You can benefit from both of them. And so Laodicea is a common place in Scripture. Here's how Leon Morris describes the ancient city. He says it was one of the richest commercial centers in the world so that we have here a picture of the church in an affluent society. Laodicea was noted for its banking and for its manufacture of clothing from the local black wool it boasted a famous medical school, and, and with that, out of this medical school, uh, they believe a, a, an eye salve, uh, something to help heal your eyes, uh, came out and, and was famous in the ancient world as well. But Morris also goes on to say, an interesting feature of the city's religious life was that there was a colony of over 7,000 adult male Jews 
who had been granted the right to preserve their customs. Uh, and, and as you read about this place, you find that indeed it was a well-off city, it was a proud city, uh, it was a city again in, in this region of earthquakes, and when an earthquake happened, what did they do? They said, Rome, we don't need you, we have enough money, we'll take care of ourselves. One more thing I want to teach you about this church, and that is its geographic location is quite important. Or at least it seems to be that way, right? This is the familiar letter where we hear that the church is not hot, it's not cold, but it's lukewarm. And that metaphor is likely being drawn from the fact that Colossae, down to the south, just over 10 miles, that was a place that had these cold, refreshing springs of water. Heropolis, just up the road a few miles to the north, Heropolis had some thermal springs. They had hot medicinal baths. And Laodicea is the black church symbol in the middle, and they don't have any water springs. What do you do? You need to pipe in water. And so they had aqueducts, aqueducts coming from these two directions, and, and cold water as it traveled through the aqueducts, what happens to it? It, it? it gets less cold. And hot water as it flows through its aqueducts, what happens to it? It begins to cool down. And so by the time you get to Laodicea, you end up with lukewarm water. And we might not think lukewarm water is that bad, but for them... In order for it to be even considered useful or remotely desirable, right, it had to be artificially either chilled or heated up, otherwise it was simply terrible. How the, how the commentators that I read talk about it, looking at primary sources, uh, was that you wanted nothing to do. There was no one enjoying just lukewarm water. Uh, and, and so that plays into how we understand their faith and their practice. Uh, and with that, let's hear the word of the Lord this morning. Jesus says to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and I don't need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I really don't remember why, but there was some night last week, Christy had gone to bed, and, and I decided that I was going to start looking at these doorbells with cameras online. And so I looked at Ring's website, I looked at Google's website, they've got the Nest doorbell, there's plenty of others out there, and, right, and, and you can choose from all different levels of how fancy these things are. Some of them are, are, are motion detection, motion detection sensing, and, and as soon as it picks up a certain amount of movement, it will start a video onto your phone or your computer for you to watch. Others, they, they wait for the person to press the doorbell, just like the old doorbells, right? And, and then it starts a video, and, and some, it's not just the video, right, but it's an intercom. You can use your phone, and you can speak to who's ever at your door. Uh, don't worry, Buildings and Grounds Committee, I didn't buy one, uh, and so none of you are going to see that at the Parsonage quite yet. It's not there. Uh, but while I'm intrigued by that modern technology, uh, this passage and, and just the, the thought, the image of someone knocking on a door brought back a flood of memories for me. As a kid, I, I can remember going around my neighborhoods to friends' houses to play or going around to other people's houses trying to sell something for a school fundraiser. And already at a young age, I greatly disliked doing this. 
I greatly dislike going to someone's door and knocking on it. I greatly dislike going to someone's door and ringing the doorbell. And someone can diagnose my anxiety later, but uh, I was afraid as a kid that if I rung the doorbell and someone was napping, I was going to wake them up and, and they'd come to the door mad at me. I, I was worried that if no one answers, I've got to decide, well, how long do I wait at this door before I knock and ring again? Or, or, or do I try the opposite one now? And, and if still no one comes, well, I do, do I try a third time or, or do I just walk away and go home? What if I pressed the doorbell, but I didn't push it far enough? I, I thought I heard it. I thought I heard the little chime or the ding, but I don't know. Uh, should I, I look in the window? Should I look in the garage to see if a, a person is home, if someone's vehicle is home? What if, heaven forbid, I look in a window and someone is in, is in medical distress, and that's why they're not answering the door? You can see my conundrum. I, I just wish that my friends would come find me at my house, and we'd go play, or I will go do a fundraiser at the local grocery store and sell my candy bars there. But that's not the only image that I, I had in mind. That's not the only thought that came through my head. That's on the outside. What about when you're on the inside? When you're in the house and someone comes by and you say, I really don't want anything to do with them. Right? If you live in the country, you probably don't have this as much. But if you're in town, right, you've, you've been at your home, you've looked out the window, or you were outside for a second, and you've seen that pair of Jehovah's Witnesses coming around, or you've seen that church group, or you've seen that kid who's selling something, or you've seen so, some retail, some businessman going door to door trying to sell something or promote something, and you don't have time for it. Right? And, and, and some of them are really pesky, right? They won't take no for an answer. And so just because you have this door and someone can come to the door and they can knock and they can ring the doorbell, you don't have to answer. And so when they do come, you choose not to answer. Maybe you stay away from your windows. You're out of sight and you wait for them to go away. But I've got one more case. We hear of Jesus standing at the door of the Laotian church and he's knocking, but we also read him saying, here I am. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door. And that triggered memories that I've had both here and in South Dakota where someone came to the door and they knocked or they rang the doorbell and, and either I didn't hear it or, or I was off doing something and, and wasn't paying much attention, but but this person, they tried the doorknob, they found it was unlocked, and they opened the door, and they stuck in their head, and they said, Hello, is anyone there? And let me tell you, you can get away with that here in a small town, but I would not advise you trying that in an urban area. Uh, do not do that in bigger cities. But doors mean a lot. Here we are in this final letter in Revelation 3, and doors keep coming up. I, I had the image up just a, a couple weeks ago of the thief breaking in. And in that passage, we don't even see the word door. But last week, we did hear about a door. Right? We heard about Jesus holding the key of David. And what he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. And then in chapter 3, verse 8, he tells the church in Philadelphia, See, I have placed before you an open door. And the idea there, the concept there, is that there's an open door to heaven. There's an open door to the kingdom of God, and it is for them to go through. And that shows up again, this next verse after where we ended today. Chapter 4, verse 1, John writes, After this, after I've received these letters from Jesus, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had heard first, speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here. Right? And so we have open doors, we have open invitations, go on in. And yet the door in Laodicea, sandwiched between these two passages, is a closed door. And so what we're going to do today as we go through this passage is that we're going to look at two points. First of all, who's on one side of the door, and then second, who's on the other. And so we begin with this question, who's on the inside? Who's on the inside? I've told you already quite a bit about the citizens of Laodicea, the Christians there included, but that doesn't seem like it was always the case for them. Right? If, if you go back to the book of Colossians, the first time that we hear about the people in Laodicea, Paul writes, I want you to know, the people in Colossians, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea. Paul's struggling for them. He wants them to, to receive the gospel, to receive his ministry. 
But in chapter 4, verse 15, uh, he's in the, the greetings part of that, right? The final message. And he says, give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And, and most think that this woman, Nympha, and this church is the house church that existed in Laodicea. Right? Those texts where Laodicea was mentioned don't give a window. They don't really help our understanding of how or why or that this even was a closed-door church. As Jesus addressed just a few decades later. And I can't tell you this morning with authority what happened. I can't tell you what happened in those 30-ish years. Why they would go from being a place that Paul struggled for and he suffered for to a place that, that, that Jesus has to speak rather severely to. However, it does seem from Revelation 3 that the culture around them and the culture of this church had influenced and changed them for the worse. Here's what, what Richard Phillips has to say. He says the problem that Jesus notes in Laodicea was not persecution, it was not gross sin. It was not false teaching. In terms of circumstances, it seems, Laodicea was singularly blessed. And again, you can pick that up in verse 17. Jesus says, you say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, and I don't need a thing. Right? That's what something who is blessed and who is enjoying what they have says. But Richard Phillips goes on to say, for this reason, however, the people had lost their zeal for Christ. It was a spiritually apathetic church. The people gathered for worship, but they came like those today who look more frequently to their watches than to the Bible. They probably believed the right things, but those truths did not affect them deeply. When it came to Jesus, they were believers, but only lukewarmly so. What comparison is he making there? What is this spiritually apathetic church? One of the marks of such a church or of such a believer is that worship services become the, the sole visible piece of your faith. The sole visible piece that maybe you're a Christian. Right? The worship service simply becomes that, that this is the place where, that people see and, and it's a weekly or a monthly cycle in your life. You want to be able to say that, that if God looks down from heaven, he sees me sometimes in that building that they call a church. And maybe we even want a few other specific people to say, hey, that person, they were in church this week. They're a Christian. Or we'll mention it very briefly in a conversation elsewhere that, hey, I, I was in church on Sunday. But as soon as worship is over, we hit the road onto the far more important, far more desirable, far more exciting parts of our day and our life. Right? We want to know, be known as being part of the church. We want that label of Christian applied to us. But we don't invest time and energy into faith and discipleship. Right? We don't want others to say, well, they're too Christian, or they're too churchy, or too involved. The spiritually apathetic church and believer wants Jesus around, but they do not want to be confronted. They do not want to be convicted of their sin. They do not want to be changed by him. <clears throat> They know that he's there. They know about him, and that's enough. And that's what kind of church the Laodicean church had become. If the letter that we read in Revelation 3, and if Philip's commentary wasn't enough, here's what Dr. Wyma says. He says the church in Laodicea was vain, overly confident of their superiority to other churches and their self-sufficiency. Sadly, they were blind to their true spiritual condition, Christ's complaint is directed toward the whole church. Right? There's not a, some of you are over here, but many of you are this way. There's none of that. It's the whole or nothing. These people had convinced themselves all was well, and yet things obviously weren't. Jesus says otherwise. Right? What well, we read it in verse 16, I'm about to spit you out, it is more literally from the Greek, I'm about to vomit you out, I'm about to hurl you out, I'm about to throw you up, and, and I know that's disgusting, you say, well, you're just trying to be crass, Pastor, but no, that's not the point. Jesus is trying to make this so clear to these people that he wanted to get through to them that he has been made sick by how they are living their lives and living their faith. Maybe you remember back in Revelation 2.9, Jesus was speaking to the church in Smyrna, and he says, I know your afflictions, I know your poverty, and yet you're rich. 
And yet this church was the exact opposite, right? Whatever wealth, whatever financial and material wealth these people had and claimed, they were impoverished spiritually. I want to be clear, though, for the time being, they were still a church. Right? Jesus addresses them as a church. They had the Christian faith. They knew the same God that you and I believe in and that we worship but things were not good. They needed to change. They truly needed Jesus. And the same is true for spiritually apathetic churches today. Go back to Richard Phillips, and this is what he writes. He says, The church does not always approve the enthusiasm of a man such as John Wesley, who went into the fields preaching the gospel. The church does not always approve, but Christ does. The church may urge a man such as William Carey to shrink back from wasting his life among the heathens of India. If you don't know William Carey, which I didn't either, uh, but William Carey is a man who in the late 1790s and and to the end of his life in the 1830s, he went to India and, and, and among other things, as a missionary and a teacher, he translated the Bible into six different Indian languages and he, he translated parts of it into 29 other languages and dialects. This is a man who some might say, you know, get away from those heathens. Stop wasting your life. But Philip says Christ was delighted and displayed his glory in the success of that gospel mission. Carey's motto, attempt great things for God, expect great things from God, was the very antithesis of the Laodicean malaise. If you're trying to make sense of what he says, look no farther than verse 19 in our passage that, that Jesus says, be earnest. Other translations put it, I think, more clearly, be zealous. Right? Yes, our our worship services, according to the Apostle Paul, are to be fitting and they're to be done orderly and, and everything is supposed to have its time and place and be calm. But that doesn't mean that in the spread of the gospel of Christ's kingdom that we have to be boring or that we have to be passionless or lazy or even so that we would be deaf to Christ himself. That's who's on the inside of a church like the one that Jesus rebukes here. They had some significant issues that needed to be dealt with. But what about the one on the other side of the door? Who is Jesus, the one doing the knocking and calling through that door? What do we learn about him? Well, we aren't going to hit everything in this passage, but I do want to focus on what you see up on the screen. Verses 18 through 20. Right? Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. I counsel you to buy from me white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. I, invite, or I counsel you to buy from me salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and co- opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. And he with me. What do you see there? Well, the very first thing that you should see there is that Jesus was still there. Right? Much like I said that, that the Laodicean church, at least for the time being, was still a church, Jesus was still present and waiting and offering himself to be their Lord and Savior. They had pushed him away. They would even kept him out, ignored him at the door, and yet he's there patiently waiting. He's there. Secondly, he's also offering the things that will truly help and heal these people. Again, Laodicea was a rich city. It had this booming black wool industry. It had a medical school putting out this special eye salve that was popular. If you were living in Laodicea, it seems like you were in Beverly Hills. Right? You've made it. Your life is safe. It is secure. It is carefree. You have made it. If you were not from Laodicea, maybe you wished you were. These people were trusting what they had, and Jesus warned them that none of that stuff, none of that your life has this in it, will save you. None of it will redeem you. None of it will restore you. And yet with the warning, he tells them, I've got what you need. Buy from me. And so now you can go to your friends and neighbors, and you can tell them, hey, my pastor this week said you can buy, you can pay money for salvation. Did you know that? Or your pastor, he has a gold guy who's named Jesus. So if you want gold, make sure you go through him. Or I have a pay-for-healing type ministry, and none of that is true. But I think Richard Phillips is right when he directs us to the economics in Isaiah 55. 
Maybe you remember I mentioned the same chapter, that same first verse, just a few weeks ago. But among the four invitations that are given is this one. In Isaiah 55, 1, Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. The Lord God Almighty goes on to say, Why spend money on what's not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? And so maybe you're wondering, well, well what do we have to do, right? How, what do we have to pay then? What do, we, what do we give him? And this is what you give him. He says, listen. Listen to me and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me, hear me, that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Jumping down to verse 6, he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. There's no price that we can pay for the covenant love of God. He has offered it already, and he has paid for it completely with his blood. And so these Laodicean Christians, they were to see that Jesus was still there. Jesus was offering freely what they truly needed. And you just heard me say the third thing, that Jesus still loved them. Jesus loved this church. If he didn't love them, he would not be spending his time rebuking them, disciplining them, standing at the door, knocking, calling to them. And those of you who have rebellious children, who have a son or daughter who's rather wayward in their life and in their actions and their faith, or if you're someone who has friends and family who, who, who you would hope that they would come to you, who you would hope and you are praying constantly to God, God, change this person's heart. Bring them back to yourself. You're looking at them and you're saying, hopefully this last mistake, hopefully it's the last one, they will stop stumbling and falling. Or you have a certain grief about you that you are wondering, why doesn't this person listen? Don't they see that I know what's best or at least better? It's easy for others to look at you if that is you and to look down on you and to say, hey, just give up already. Why do you, stop? Why do you keep caring about them? Why do you who have a heart of mercy and hope think that it's worth doing this. You're wasting your time. Jesus in his love was not giving up on these people. Amid the harshness and the severity of this letter, and all the commentators say, if you want to know what is the, the harshest letter in these seven, it is this one. What is the most severe letter in these seven? It is this one. There is tough love here. There are blunt assessments that Jesus makes, but why does he continue to care? Why did he take this time to speak to John so that he would write it down, so that he would bring it to these people? Because Jesus loved them. They needed to be rebuked and disciplined. Why? Well, the author of Hebrews tells us, you've heard me say this before. Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 7, endure hardship as discipline. Why? Because God is treating you as his sons. We have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? God disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. It's painful for a time, but later on it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And here's what we close with this morning. Then, brothers and sisters, this love wasn't just for a single group of believers in the city of Laodicea back then. It wasn't even just for the five churches that received rebukes in Revelation 2 and 3, being told, you need to shape up. In his patience, Jesus still loves difficult churches and difficult believers. But with that, his command and his promise are also still the same. His command is this, be zealous and repent. Repent. If you do that, his promise is the same. That he will open, or he will come into that open door and he will commune with you. Whatever barrier or obstacle is in the way of us and God, of you and God, of I and God, whatever past or present, remember this. He knows it. Right? He is displeased with our sin. He is not ignorant of it. He's not, oh, I had no idea that you guys were sinners. Yet he by his love, he desires to lead people. 
He desires to lead his sons and daughters who he loves in Christ. He desires to lead them, to lead us to holiness. And so, brothers and sisters, if he's knocking, he loves you. Let him in already. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks that the testimony to your faithfulness and your mercy was not reaching its fullest potential simply in your work in the Laodicean church. That it reached its cap, that there was no option for mercy left, that there was no potential of your mercy left but that those promises that you are a good and that you are a gracious and that you are a merciful God continue still today. That you are a God who does love difficult churches, that you are a God who loves wayward believers, who you are calling back to yourself. You love us so much that you would rather us not stay pursuing the things that our sinful nature tells us to pursue but you love us in such a way that you will discipline us that we might be led to your holiness, that we might be led to experience your glory. Lord, we do pray this morning that that you would be with those of us who, who have these family members and these friends who maybe even ourselves know that we are who's being talked about, that we are the apathetic ones, that we are the ones who who simply want the bare minimum. We want the labels on us, but we don't want to give or be involved or be seen as too much a part of this. Lord, help us to see that you have everything that is worth having. But Lord, along those lines, those lines of of being a church that is passionate about your mission and about evangelism, Lord God, we pray that you'd work in us in that way too. Lord God, even when it doesn't seem to make much sense, even when we worry about numbers that that can be quantified and and to be able to say, well, it was was worth putting money in. It was worth sending someone over to this place or that place. Lord, allow us to see that those who go out are serving your call. They're not simply doing what they want to do. May it be, O God, that we would desire, may it be that you would set a flame in us by your Holy Spirit to serve you, whether that's at home or abroad being called far into many, or being called to the few in our homes, in our churches, in our communities. Lord, have your way with us and let us listen to you. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. At this time, I want to invite our praise team up. They're going to come forward and uh, lead us in the song of response, Rescue the Perishing, and while we're singing, our offering will be received. Care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We bore the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently, he will forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Down in the human heart, 
crushed by the tempter. Feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, chords that were broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Brothers and sisters, would you rise to receive our parting benediction? As you go from this place, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. We close this morning with home. Amen.